Wow, welcome. Wonderful to see all the people coming in, joining us today. And give it a few minutes for, for admitting people from the waiting room and people that are still joining us. Thank you for coming. That's and thank great. you for hosting. <laughs> I see at least one of our artists here. There's probably more of them, two of them. I see Colin Page. Hi, Colin. Welcome. That's great. Great to see so many people on a Sunday afternoon. And I feel like it's just become fall. <clears throat> you know, the leaves aren't completely gone yet. <laughs> We're not quite into winter. We're still in that season where there's lots of color and beautiful late afternoon light. light. So I'm going to get started. Um, I'm sure there will be people still coming in, but we have about 70 people here, and that's wonderful to see. And um, so I just want to start by welcoming everybody. There's some people I'm sure that are new to the Poets' Corner and many people that I recognize who have been coming back for many of our monthly readings. And it's so good to see all of you. Just for those who are new to let you know that the Poets' Corner was founded in June of 2020 by myself and my dear friend, Catherine Seitz. And it's her wonderful energy that helped us launch this. And today her health prevents her from being involved, um, but her energy is still here. But we got together, and as you know, we were all sheltered in, and we needed community. So we wanted to create that for ourselves and for other people who loved reading and writing poetry and short prose. And in the past three years, this community has grown to more than 3,000 members from all over the world. And we host monthly readings that are usually on the second Sunday of each month. And before I introduce today's program that I'm very excited about and all of the wonderful poets who are with us today, I'd like to preview a little bit about what's coming up on the Poets Corner. On Sunday, December 3rd, the first Sunday in the month of December, we'll have our third annual Rilke reading with the award-winning translator and of Rilke and poet Mark Burroughs. This year, he'll be joined again by Padre Gotuma, the Irish poet and peace activist and host of the very popular podcast, Poetry Unbound. And for the first time, uh, we'll also have Marie Howe joining us. The three of them will share some of Rilke's poetry and talk about his influence on them personally and on the world. And Marie Howe is also going to be the judge for our 2024 chapbook competition. This year, it is in collaboration with the with Toad Hall Editions, who will publish the winning chapbook, and with the Camden Festival of Poetry, where the winner will be announced. Stay tuned for more information about that. In January, we'll continue our craft talk series with the two-part workshop on publishing your poetry with Chelsea Jackson, editor of the Maine Review. And our reading in January will coincide with the launch of a new literary magazine published by Downey's Books and called The Maine Standard. And we'll feature a group of nine poets 
that call themselves the Nine Poets. And they are a group that I'm a part of that first met in June of 2020 in a workshop with Richard Blanco and have continued to write and support each other's work ever since and will be published together in that first inaugural issue of the main standard. So now for today. First of all, I'd like to thank Page Gallery, Colin Page and Kirsten Serby. This is the third year that we've hosted this ekphrastic art and ekphrastic poetry event together. And it's just such a wonderful collaboration. They contact the artists, they put up this exhibition that's in the gallery and online of beautiful art. Then we do a selection um, by the poets from the Poets' Corner and a selection by the artists and that selection will be read in the gallery next weekend on Saturday, November 18th at one o'clock. So if you're in the Camden area, please come to that reading as well. The poet selections were made by a group of readers that include, included Austin Rodenbiker and Pam Brunell. And I wanna thank both of them as well for their tireless reading of more than 160 poems that were submitted. And, you know, in making these final 10 selections, we each of them must have read those poems at least two times. And that final pool of selections that we were considering from, we all read out loud and very carefully thought about 10 poets just trying to narrow it down to 10, which is a difficult task because there were so many wonderful submissions. But I think you'll be really pleased with the poets and the selection and flow that we have with the here today. So with that, I'm going to start. I'm going to introduce each poet simply by name and where they're from. We will show the art, we'll ask them to read, and if they want to say a couple of words about the process of writing the poem, they're welcome to. And then after they've all had a chance to read, we'll have a chance, we'll have a conversation about ekphrastic poetry, the process of writing, what it's like. Um, if any of the artists want to comment, I would really welcome that. And then we'll open it up to questions in the chat. So thank you all again for being here and many, many thanks to the poets who submitted and especially the poets you're gonna hear today. And we're gonna begin with a poet from Belfast, Maine, a former poet laureate of Belfast, Judy Kaber. Thank you, Meg. So this is the second year that I've been um, reading as part of this program. Uh, last year, I read at the Page Gallery, and that's a wonderful place. If you've never been there, I really um, would urge you to go there uh, if you're in the area. I know some people are not. So I was really drawn to uh, Colin Page's painting, Memorable Patterns. Um, and that is the, the painting that I wrote a poem to. So um, I think the painting is supposed to come up and I'll read the poem. There it is. Okay. Got so it's called One Blue Hand Fingers spread as if to stop us. Lean in close and have a look. Here, the flutter of my life rests on a tablecloth printed with brown flowers. Odd what I've collected in my long battle for meaning. Kitchen matches, a few flowers, Oranges sliced, but not eaten. Certainly books. 
I wonder what these unpocketed things reveal about me. I don't see any coins or the oil lamp I usually keep on this table. The smell of its smoke, so comforting when the power goes out. Do you recognize the cards? Maybe they're meant to call back my youth, or they could be my son's. When someone dies, this is what you find, a scattering of objects they've dropped from a slow moving boat, like rough stones marking a passage, a bright yes, like a dog rolling in grass. Interpret it through the lens of your own life. There's nothing shrill here, nothing to make you sweat and worry. The pitcher may be empty, but it would be easy enough to fill. Sift through this maze, box it up or fling it aside. Nothing but bare bones here, lost objects, things a painter might lace together in a still life. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Beautiful, beautiful poem. Our next reader will be David Sloan, um, who is coming to us from Brunswick, Maine. Thank you very much, Meg. <clears throat> this is also my second opportunity to um, read uh, with for this program. Um, it's been a great honor. Um, I have to say that um, I've since I've uh, I discovered what ekphrastic poetry was, um, and and since I learned how to spell it, um, it's uh, it's been uh, always been a wonderful challenge to to try to find a way to uh, express in words an impression that a and a piece of artwork has made on me. This this time I was drawn to Sarah Horowitz's ask for a needle and thread. So if uh, we can see the image, the point after Sarah Horowitz's ask for a needle and thread. Plucked from a wetland's margin, the arrowhead tendrils still ripple like filaments in a tidal marsh. But the closer my granddaughter looks, the more the leaves shapeshift, first into silver fish in brackish waters, drifting past lures, then wind-borne into birds, woodpecker, owl, grouse, perching on impossibly flimsy limbs. She peers closer, sees a bunny below, a flying turtle, a kite straining to pull the entire delicate architecture away from earth, from grabby hands, to let it carousel like a slow twisting mobile. And what of the spool, a single blue strand entangled in the track of a petiole? Two needles lie waiting to be threaded. She asks, what needs mending? I don't know how to answer. She can't foresee the future, how any plant ripped away from its corm will wilt and shrivel, how the rueful hands that uprooted it all now will spend endless hours by a window, stitching the needle point she hopes will preserve for a time what otherwise would be forever lost. What a beautiful reading, David, and stitching together through time what otherwise would be forever lost. That's what we do with our poems. The next uh, poet will be Sarah Bitter, who is coming to us from Seattle, Washington. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm so grateful for this program. Um, I also read last year, oh, I didn't, but my poem was uh, read last year at the gallery 
And um, it's so wonderful to get interact with such great work. So um, this is the piece I'm responding to. And here's the poem. Consider whether solutions exist and if they are unique. After Antonio Monroe's textile fragment with band of white and blue diagonal flowers. Agree with me that the easiest thing to remember is a garden, plant by plant, easier than a sister's trauma or your own. Disassociation being a word you just learn to remember, but you don't, and your sister does remember, or maybe she makes it up stitch by stitch, satin and chain and stem. My sister once embroidered a Christmas stocking with a teddy bear for my daughter. My sister is the disassociation. I believe I'm looking at blue forget-me-nots. I don't believe my sister has any in her garden, but I do. Although every year they get leggy, sister, I let them grow. What did our father do and not do? I lived through it all and I don't know. My father's sister taught me to embroider, needle piercing cloth, forget me not, forget me not. I was with my sister this year for my birthday and all day she didn't wish me a happy one. This is, of course, the sister stitch. Across the embroidery, neat blossoms that almost look like real flowers, a memory I can't sister. Um, it's worth mentioning, I think, that this is kind of in the form of a guzzle, um, but I wouldn't say it's a guzzle because it doesn't follow all the rules, but it is a, a form that um, has a long tradition. I always believe in not following all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does. And it's a beautiful poem, beautiful guzzle. So, and I love that, that maybe she makes it up stitch by stitch. Well, yeah, great lines. Yeah, such a privilege to get to respond to that art. Great. Our next poet is Lucinda Ziesing, coming to us from Rockport, Maine. I just had to unmute myself. Um, I love this collaboration between the Poets Corner and, and the Page Gallery. I love it. Um, I, whoops, I'm just trying to get, oh dear, this is up. Um, I think you better go on. I had my poem. I'm not very technically, okay, here we go. See, I my poem is there. Maybe you can, can you, sh I have to, I, I don't know if I can read it and you can show it at the same time because I, I have it up on my computer now so I can see my poem to read to you. Is this okay, Meg? Yeah, you can see your poem and Lucas will share the image which he well, had up there. <clears throat> when I share right. the image, it's going to cover her poem. I think that's what happened. Oh, you want people to see your poem, Lucinda? No, no, no. no. I, I just want to see it. <laughs> okay. I just uh, I'll share the image. I'll share the image after after the reading again. All right. Okay. Well, I hope that my words can show you the, the painting, but I want you to see the painting because as I looked at it and I began to spin inside David Wilson's painting sprite, I felt that a spell had been cast on me. And this led me to find a tiny ancient codex from the 16th century Italy called the Tree of Life. Inside it were 125 Arabic charms and spells. And something about the power of snakeskin. So I thought to start the poem with a spell of in invisibility. If you sprinkle some of the dust into your eyes, you will see, but you will not be seen. 
a shadow play. It begins by a brook in a world according to Sprite at the end of harvest time and the start of the long dark night. The fires are lit, the screen door hinge between worlds. It's possible to travel both ways were we not blinded by incandescent light. The fly and moth misled to now stuck and stenciled to a screen. Our ancestors walk in dark to return sight. They smell the pine, they listen for mallards navigating by moon. The mystery appears as a black rose on the trunk, as a stump alive yet felled 300 years before as a shaded sapling reaching the sky. Trees live in an electrical web below ground, passing resources back and forth, the young and the old fed together. Above the thunderstorm flashes of red sprites. If you want to travel both ways, open the door, turn the porch light off. Okay, now you can share that incredible poem. There it is. There is so much mystery, Lucinda, in this painting, but also in your poem, poem there that you've captured with the spells and the imagery and Lovely, lovely, lovely reading. Thank you. And what's fun is that now we are going to have Elizabeth Kelbs read her poem to the same that was written to the same um, painting, Sprite. Elizabeth, you are still muted. Elizabeth is joining us from Los Angeles, California. So sorry about that. The screen looked a little bit uh, different there for a second. Um, wow, Lucinda, that was uh, amazing. Um, a hard magic spell to follow, but uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to have the opportunity to uh, do that. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this wonderful event, Meg, it was uh, uh, really a joy to have the opportunity to appreciate all of the artworks. And like Lucinda, I was especially drawn to Sprite. I happen to live in wildfire country and so connected with the scorched landscape in the painting and the wild energy in the flying figures and uh, the little glimmers of hope in the elements with light. So my poem is also called Sprite. What next? The red lightning firing starward from cumulonimbus crowns? The infinite flocks of flapping toasters, insatiable circles, rose petal glamours? Will it be the sugar glittered grapes that leave such spiraled shine in the iris before the scorch and rootless dance, before the dashed bees, the charring rain. Do you know how strong the severed trunks submerged beyond the realm of oxygen? How sweetly the long mineral song will bloom from sunken sapwood how patient the faintest wing, still unfurled, still veined with light. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, I just find it so wonderful to hear two such different responses to the same painting 
And in this one of yours that's responding to the scorched earth and the light and the burnt trees. Just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our next poet is Maya Stein, and she was not able to be with us to, um, this afternoon. So she is reading uh, her poem via a video. And so, Lucas, if you could show the painting that she was responding to first, um, which is Cyan Kitchen by Susan Lichtman. And then we're going to show my reading on video. Go ahead and play the, the video if you can, and we'll, we've had a chance to see this beautiful painting. Whoops, I think we lost the video. Here we go. Hi, I'm Maya Stein, and I'm grateful to the Poets Corner for choosing my poem, Succulent in Winter, to pair with Susan Lichtman's painting, Cyan Kitchen. And thanks also to the Page Gallery for hosting a wonderful exhibit. Here's the poem, Succulent in Winter. The house is a maze of small upheavals at the dining room table, a pile of bills and letters needing payment and reply, holiday cards colliding on the mantle, discs of lip balm overlapping in a dish already mounted with coupons and stray rubber bands. This is the lumpy topography of living, a labyrinth we navigate with lopsided measures of engagement and avoidance and today might easily beckon as the grandest of cleanups before the year snaps shut. Still, I don't quite know where to begin, which stack to start dismantling, and my eyes shift from clutter to clutter, gauging the work ahead, almost missing the windowsill, where a cactus purchased two summers ago in Austin is quietly maintaining a tidy ecosystem above a sink full of breakfast dishes, its spine soft against the glass in an innocent dare of beauty or hope or both. Thank you. That was really wonderful too. Um, Love that poem of bias. It's a prose poem and uh, just beautifully observed, I think. Our next poet is Cynthia Reeves from Camden, Maine. Thank you, Meg. And thank you for organizing this. Um, I really enjoyed every painting, every object in the gallery. I had a chance to go a couple of times and what a wonderful place. I'm responding to James Abbott's collage, Old Friends, there it is. And um, I was drawn to this because I love tools. I love going to uh, antique stores and looking at tools. Um, I'm not really sure what draws me to them, but in any event, that's what drew me to this. That and I had written, I had visited um, the general store at the, uh, where the Monhegan Island Ferry leaves. And I know that more recently, I believe it's all or partly burned down. I have to return, um, which is kind of interesting given what this poem is about um, because it's, sort of exists in that liminal space between the past and the present. And I suppose now it's the past and the past, but in any event, the other 
was some notes I had made from a visit to the Port Clyde Sardine Cannery, which used to be on that peninsula and uh, closed a uh, long time ago. And um, my grandmother worked there and uh, I went there to see it and it was gone. The Port Clyde Sardine Cannery. Nothing but pilings remain, footprint of the old cannery where once conveyors throbbed, sardines cartwheeled as if they could swim backward, scales glazed, blades flashed, eyes flung open even as heads fell into waste. Fish crammed four by four and shut away in tins coursed the line. A hiss rose, the giant steamer stream fog from broken seals. Canning women chattered to factory rhythms, metal on metal shriek of gears, rollers, drums. Oh, the noise, passing their lives on. My grandmother toiled on this ship, 60 years, the 12 hour shift, a continuous flow of fish. It seemed to carry her someplace. The general store where she bought her nickel coffee stands secure on its moorings. Steam spirals above glass pots. The wooden flooring darkens, unburdening time. Battered tools, threadbare wrench, tattered hammer, a rusty lock lacking its useless key. A screwdriver yearning for something out of reach hang preserved in a timber frame behind the counter, out of time. The cannery, I asked the dozy clerk, selling bait and donuts and yesterday's papers. She nods to the shrouded pilings without, while far away keening of the evening's last Monhegan Island ferry fades into dusk. There are so many things I loved about this poem. And, and one is knowing the devastating fire that took place there and how much is gone forever yeah. and how much you can recapture and recreate in a poem like this and, and bring it to life, but bring it to a new life. So thank you for, for thank doing you. that. Um, our next poet is Anna Warwick, who is coming to us from Salt Lake City, although she lives in Somerville, Mass. Hello, thank you, Meg, and, and thank you to Poets Corner. Um, it is indeed a wonderful opportunity to look at quite a variety of wonderful art and get inspired. So thank you for that. And thank you all for the poets too. This has been a wonderful afternoon. Uh, I was drawn to um, Gideon Bach's painting, uh, Megan Brady as a young Grace Hardigan, uh, because I wanted to see if I could make something out of it. Uh, I love the colors. Uh, I loved perceiving what was going on in there, but I didn't know who Grace Hardigan was my own unfortunate ignorance. So I looked her up. And for those of you who don't know, um, she was an American abstract expressionist painter, very active in the New York school in the 50s and 60s. Uh, she became the director of the Hofburger School of Painting in Baltimore in 1965. And her work is collected in prestigious institutions, Museum of Modern Art in Minneapolis and the Smithsonian. But it's also true that if you look her up, you will see that it says that she's in group shows, but often other names like Jackson Pollock and uh, Willem and Elaine de Kooning and Helen Frankenthaler, whom I do know, and she's not listed, so, um, but her work is fantastic, actually. And this poem uh, came about in part because I listened to an interview. Uh, there's a 15 minute interview the Smithsonian did with her. 
Uh, and her words are in here and I'll preface them with her name, Grace. Live in it. Megan Brady as a young Grace Hardigan by Gideon Bach. Almost everywhere at once, the aqua bike breeds a memory, her hair fizzing under the helmet as she sped unacknowledged through. Megan, are you grieving? Nothing in its place, though a place for everything. White coffee cup lid. Grace, the painting projects from the surface again, over again, rather than receding as it did with perspective. Grace in an interview and Megan in a brown chair next to another chair while into the room, twin aqua fans Below air breathed for millennia. A blue mask foregrounded on the red floor. Two sketches of an arm in space spacesuit white on black. Grace, every part is as important as every other part. Eventually, the painting tells you what it wants. Ghost bench, bedspread, a film of white where we once, with its orange highlight, echoed by the edge of Megan's face and hand before her easel. Thank you, Anna. And, and thank you for that introduction to Grace Hardigan. I also had to look her up. And I think that's one of the wonderful things that you know we get from from this kind of exhibition, we get to look at wonderful art and we get to learn new things in the way your poem interwove both the present, the painting, your thoughts and and Grace Hardigan is wonderful. Thanks. Yes. Our next poet is Char Charlie Becker from Laguna Beach, California. Oh, thank you, Meg. <clears throat> You know, I have to tell you um, that there's kind of a long process that I that I use to write this poem, and it it begins with in June, um, my partner Aubrey and I flew to New Orleans because he was graduating from a master's program at Xavier, and a couple of minutes after we got off the plane, he had a heart attack in the airport. So from that day. Um, his, he, his life was saved by the paramedics. He was taken to a hospital and spent two months in the hospital in New Orleans where we both felt like we were just being watched over by guardian angels every day and um, learned a whole lot of vocabulary about cardiology and hospitals. So um, when I came home to California, and I read about this opportunity to write an ekphrastic poem, as soon as I saw the painting, um, Red Chairs by Gail Spann, I felt as though it somehow it inspired all of my emotions and all of the vocabulary that I learned to come together in a poem. So the name of this poem is called Echo Lucent. At cardiac rehab, they tell me those storms have stopped. I'm reassured it is safe to walk outside again. My breathless fog has lifted. Clogged clouds circulate free and screen doors open pathways newly flush. I'm reassured it is safe to walk outside again, too cushioned chairs inhabit me, red chambered friends who chat, and screen doors open pathways newly flush with dreams of beach umbrellas, pink toes imprinting sand. Two cushioned chairs inhabit me, red chambered friends who chat, gemmed cells 
refloat my future like collaterals rich in diamond mines with dreams of beach umbrellas, pink toes imprinting sand as echoes pump the light of open-hearted afternoons. Gem cells refloat my future like collaterals rich in diamond mines. Steep healings pulse tamed bluebirds into one swirled cirrus horizon. As echoes pump the light of open-hearted afternoons and puzzles search for pieces the way mistook clues go seek solutions. Steep healings pulse tamed bluebirds into one swirled cirrus horizon. My whole world now and everything gracing everything, nothing less. And puzzles search for pieces the way mistook clues go seek solutions among woven rugs grounding this changed body, a summered waiting room. My whole world now and everything gracing everything, nothing less. Each paced beat leaves me another and another and more others among woven rugs grounding this changed body, a summered waiting room. At cardiac rehab, they tell me those storms have stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. I, I think one of the things that struck me so much about this poem is the introduction of something that I might not have expected to be there, but I get the association through the color and, and your evocative imagery. And not everyone looking at that poem would, I mean, looking at that painting would have that same response, but everyone would respond to your poem. Which is, is it a pantoum? There, there's yes. a repetition of lines in there that, yes, yeah, yeah, it is a form. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that painting, Red Chairs by Gail Spain, evoked so many wonderful, wonderful poems. I, 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 maybe there were 15 different people that wrote to that, and we decided to select two that were, were some favorites of the readers and ourselves. So the last poet reading is also writing to Red Chairs, and that is Margaret Haberman from Belfast, Maine. So we're back in Maine again. Back in Maine. Charlie, that was beautiful. And uh, it's... Uh, to give you my own context uh, to this poem, my extended family loves puzzles. I actually don't really love puzzles, but my mom, my sister, my cousin, there's always a puzzle at my mom's house. And I think they got through COVID by doing puzzles. Um, so long history of puzzles. And I started this poem uh, kind of soon after the it opened up and, uh, and I was really drawn to the puzzles and the color of the chairs. And then um, the shooting happened in Lewiston um, on October 25th. And that um, hit my, I happened to be a sign language interpreter. And so that hit my community. Um, it, it's been kind of seismic. It's a very small community in, in Maine. And so, Somehow I pulled it together to finish the poem. And I think I got it in like at 1159 on the last day. And the title of my poem is While You Were Gone and something about just finishing it after this tremendous loss and tragedy. I kept thinking of that, you know, while you were gone and that the poem and the painting are, are simultaneously about, for me, about a kind of absence and also an expectation of return. 
the door is still open. Uh, and, and so here's the poem. <laughs> While you were gone. Looking for the color of the sea, I played Goldilocks, sat in your empty chair to put the puzzle all in place, working on the borders in an effort to contain the rest and what we might forget. The feel of the day, the way the red chairs blossomed like poppies and played harmony to the bits of light on a dusty ocean, refracting far off islands, pancakes on a horizon, clouds of infinity swirls. All of it blending the story unfolding piece by piece of what we knew was a puzzle unanswerable, but worth the try over and over. We said no more than a thousand pieces, as if that too was a way to keep it all together, moving from the outside toward the center. It wasn't that it was easy or came to me like some secret power, a clue tucked and then found in a pocket of a coat that hasn't been worn for a very long time. I just took one piece and then another moved them around the small table until it made sense, like a wheel that comes true. There may be something missing. There's always something missing. Under the rug, beneath the table, out there on the rocks sloping into the bay. It won't matter. I'll keep working until you come back to show me patterns I cannot find or see, to show me what was there all this time. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I I just, that line as, as if that was a way to keep it all together. And with, you know, such tragedies, the personal and the, the community, tragedy and the way that poem can help us keep it together. Lovely, lovely work. And what I'd like to do, first, I'd like to invite Colin Page, if you would like to say a word or two. This was your gallery, your exhibit, such wonderful, evocative artwork that we had to work with. Well, we love doing this event every year. It's a real treat for us. Um, for it's, it's so fun to have people who aren't <clears throat> regular visitors to the gallery coming in uh, so often just to sit and, and be with the work. And uh, I, one of my favorite parts about this is it slows people down when they walk in to look at the artwork. So a lot of times people walk through the gallery just sort of like in a casual stroll. But whenever we do this event, a lot of your writers, these the, you guys who are all part of this event, come in and whether it's online or in person, really like sit and like slowly look around and find something that speaks to them and then spend some time figuring out kind of like it, how they're, how they want to respond to it in poetry. Um, and I had a lot of fun reading the poems this year. As the only other thing I want to say, just like whether it's, it was reading my own poems, which is <clears throat> a real joy to see all the different perspectives people bring even to just one painting um, or reading the poems about the other pieces of art in the show. Um, it's also interesting to see how <clears throat> some people respond with very visual language. Like sometimes it's more of a story or a narrative and sometimes it's a, 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 like a memory or these very evocative things. But I think because the poems are about paintings and sculptures, that feels like the language spark, sparked by that is has a, a real visual story that it's telling. And I, I found that striking this year. Thank you. Thank you. That That is so good to hear. And have you heard comments from the artists themselves about what it's like? 
I mean, you're one of the artists, so certainly yes, well, <clears throat> for yourself. I, but. I think for all of us, for all of us artists in the um, in the show, we we've all you know submitted artwork to tons of competitions or events or any of those kinds of things. So I know all of us when we're handed a list of poems, this this is in a lot of ways, this is all about a fun celebration of art and poetry. But as soon as you're handed a stack of poems to look at and say, this is the one I'm going to choose, you think, oh, shit, like, I don't want that pressure because I don't want that to make anyone feel bad about their work because it's it's all wonderful work. Um, so I know that uh, we all appreciate every poem written and um, that people spend the time to look at our own work that much. Um, and I know uh, I, I, I've talked to a few artists who did say this is um, that it's it's really interesting how far off from the original artist, like sometimes the artist tent is mostly visual. This It's just about color and mark making. And sometimes there is a, a really deep story that they're bringing to it. But even if I do a painting that has a very specific story in my mind, the poems that come back are so wildly different from my intent. And I think that's part of the fun of this event is to see how much of our own baggage we bring to the poems we write or the art that we do right, right. <laughs> in yeah whatever both. Form both. It absolutely is. Well, yes i yes. i also love that we have this poet selection and the artist selection and i think there was this year just one overlap between the two and right. it's um you know because we're we're selecting on the basis of the poetry itself and we're looking at the art and looking at the poem and trying to figure out does it say something does it bring something fresh and new and beyond what I'm I saw when I first saw this work of art and the artists are selecting in a different way because they know what their intent was when they did the painting or whatever and and I don't know, maybe you're looking for something that, you know, makes you look at it totally differently or something that captures what you thought you were putting out there. Or like, I think sometimes for me, it's just what <clears throat> what poem makes the painting read even deeper than mm -hmm. I originally saw in it, whether it's about my own or someone else's. I think that's it's the part of the benefit of this ecrastic work with art responding to other art is that both can deepen each other. I think that is so, so true. And, and that's what I look for out of it. And also I want to invite um, Lucas, if you could uh, include all of our poets that we're reading today. And I'd like to invite some comments from the poets also, if that's okay, Colin, um, to, you know, just, I mean, many of you shared what it was like to write to the artwork, but I was struck by Colin's comment that people slow down and they look at art differently when they're thinking so deeply about how they want to respond and what calls to them. Like, how do you pick one out of all of those? And do any of you want to respond to those questions about how how you chose that particular piece and how you view a gallery of work when you think you you want to write an ekphrastic poem i anna you're un unmuted would you like to comment on that um sure i i spoke a little bit about it uh, before the poem and i think um, I, I like the challenge of looking at art. Uh, for me, it takes me out of my very personal lyric voice, one of my voices, and, and allows me to just speculate. It's very freeing for me to look at art and to, and to speculate. And I just, and I hear that in, in a lot of what was read this afternoon, that there's a certain freedom of looking at art and not interpreting it, but using it as a as a springboard. I uh, I've actually written a, a few ekphrastic poems uh, because of that. It just it it shifts me. It shifts what I'm looking at, and it shifts how I look. 
That that's great. I mean, I'm I was wanting to ask you, Charlie. It, you wrote about something so deeply personal an experience and so very different from the scenic main painting you know, of serenity and so what was that like to bring those two very different uh, experiences if you will together in your mind well what was so interesting to me is that it's the first ekphrastic poem i've ever written because i just every time i've thought about it or read about it, I, I thought, oh, I can't do that. It just sounds too hard. And I love going to museums. I love sitting and staring at favorite paintings. And I love going to galleries and standing there and talking about paintings and drawings. And so it just seemed like such a natural thing that if I let myself, I, I would, if I looked long enough, I would start to feel something and think something. And that's what it was like. I just, I, from the minute that I saw red chairs, I just felt like I wanted to say something about what I was feeling. And, um, and just, you know, line by line, I just sort of realized that uh, the whole time I was looking at her painting, that I was thinking about the in, inside of my partner's body, especially his heart. I don't know why. I don't know why it brought me to that, but it just sort of all, all the colors and all the shapes and all the, the 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 connection of things just sort of made me think of his interior. So I thought, well, <laughs> I'm going to try this. So it was it was very very healing for me. I truthfully, you know, I it it made me cry a lot. It made me talk a lot about the whole experience. So it was. I'm so grateful to this painting. <laughs> so. <laughs> That is so wonderful. I think Gail Spann is on today. Um, Gail, did you want to unmute and comment on having so many people write to your work of art? Hi there. I'm. I wasn't expecting to be on a camera, to, so um, I, you, um, Charlie, you're. Um, if I can call you Charlie, you're. Uh, you know, I don't even know what to say. Thank you. I, I'm, you know, I'm very moved. And I think um, I, you know, any anybody that's involved in culture, if you can impact somebody, one person this way, it's pretty cool. So um, thank you. So true. And I want to thank you, Gail. I know that you wrote a note to every poet who wrote in response to your painting. And and there were many. Um, so thank you so much for for really taking the time to do that. Well, well, sure. I mean, none of us get enough feedback. So, you know, it's I mean, you everybody took the effort to do it. And so um yeah, I, I I appreciated it. So you're welcome. Lovely. None of us get enough feedback, and that was feedback to the poets. But, you know, feedback to you as an artist, too. How often do you get to hear all those people respond to your painting in different ways? It, well, it's it also, I'm, I don't know a lot about poetry. So actually, when they said, will you look at the poet's work and pick somebody, it was <laughs> I was traumatized. And, um, you know, I got that it's supposed to be fun and, 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 and I'm not the real juror, just what, um, what I respond to, but it's, um, I appreciate poetry very much because it's so visual, but I don't know a lot about it. So this was an awesome, um, opportunity. Nice. And, you know, none of us, they, there's so many people on here who submitted poems that aren't in this final selection, and it's not about what's better or worse or a qualitative, but, you know, it is what we respond to, we as the artist or we as the readers, and and also what we wanted to put together as a selection um, for everybody else. So um, 
enjoying that. I'm enjoying a few of the questions that are coming up in the chat. And one of them, uh, Nan is asking if the poets want to respond to what it's like to respond in person at the gallery or on a photo on the website. And I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to do both. I mean, you'd have to be local and able to walk in the gallery and then look at it or vice versa. Is there anybody who has, Lucinda? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this um, because I live near the gallery. Um, I, I came in and what happened to me, and so I saw it both ways. I looked at the photograph and I came in and I did that a couple of times. Um, but what happened when I saw it in person, he, um, David has used, has painted on um, monk's cloth, which is like a burlap. So that's what got me, and I didn't see that in the photograph. And so that's what really got me feeling and thinking of the image of a screen door, which was a lot of that image and going both ways and going in and out. So that and this, you know, and the fly and the moth getting caught on it. I mean, it, that absolutely fed me that information when I came into the gallery. That's that's so interesting. I mean, they could the texture of the the painting uh, spoke to you and inspired the the poem that you wrote. Uh, I'm curious, Elizabeth, you know, you're out in Los Angeles, is it? Or Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you never had a chance to see it in, in person, but what was it like for you with that same painting online? Um, I, I had a, a slight version of that experience because I wrote the poem from a printout of the painting which is so much duller than the photograph that was shown here. So um, I would really, really love to see the painting in person. I, I missed detail, that mesh in the monk's cloth and the sharpness of the images. So I, I think that that would definitely be additional inspiration to be able to go and see the piece in person in the writing. And yet I love that this way of doing it allows people from Seattle and out in Salt Lake and in California to also respond to images. And Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it yeah. truly was a joy to be able to see and appreciate all of the pieces. That's that's so fabulous. And I invite anybody who who has additional questions from the audience um, to put them in the chat. Uh, there was a question of um, the name of the Grace Hardigan painting and that the name of that is Megan Grady as a young as a young Grace Hardigan. And that's by Gideon Bach. So one of the things I enjoyed was as I was reading through each of the poems that were submitted, I go back and forth to the gallery exhibition online. Um, and I also had a chance to walk down to the gallery and see it because I live in Camden. But, but mostly I was viewing these things online and going back and forth between the poem and the painting or uh, montage or or textile work. And um, it was really very interesting to get to know these artworks in a deeper way with each poem that I read. And each time I saw a poem come in, and I'd go back and look at the painting again or whatever the artwork was again and think, oh, I didn't see that detail before. I didn't see that detail that sparked an image. 
So I'm curious for those of you who are writing, how much time do you feel you spent with that artwork? One, before you got that spark of inspiration, but then two, after you got that inspiration, going back to seeing, you know, what else is there? David. So, um, I want to first say that uh, I have nothing but gratitude for uh, the opportunity to to take in a piece of art um, that this uh, uh, program has uh, uh, enabled. Um, I think I, I I hearken back to what Colin Page said earlier on that uh, uh, what transpires when people go into the gallery itself and it slow he says it slows people down and that's exactly how i feel when i am confronted with all of these beautiful works of art and i have to choose something then that speaks to me and once i do and in, in this case the sarah horowitz um piece i felt myself just sitting and looking and then even closing my eyes and imagining, it felt like it was a portal, actually. That's what it was. It, it, it's kind of, I feel gr grateful that, especially on days where I, I don't feel like I have a whole lot of my own original ideas, here's someone who's done a whole lot of work already, created a, an image, a series of images, a whole world, and a story. And it's that story that I try to tap into. And it does take... It does take a while. It takes a while. One really has to to observe closely and then back away and uh, and 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 hope that there's going to be a spark that that ignites. Nice, nicely said. Anybody else want to comment on that? How you chose it, or Sarah? Yeah, um, it's it's interesting because I I. Um... I didn't really expect at all to write the poem that I wrote. Um, and I'm not even sure it was a super conscious choosing. I was kind of just looking at the art and uh, saw the two pieces by Antonio Monroe that were textile fragments. And it's fairly not like I generally am interested in textiles and some there's a, like a little thing that clicked in my mind about how textiles are often women's work and embroidery and stitching is often women's work. And, and there was something that, you know, in my family, there's a little bit of that in the poem that my, I was taught to embroider and my sister is the sort of difficult subject of the poem. Um, and it kind of, I think it was a subconscious conscious choice to want to interact with that piece, because as soon as I started looking at it, a lot of things that were, Go working in my mind was began working as I started looking at it. Um, and I think that's a pretty common experience for me in interacting with art is that I'll be, I'll, there'll be a piece that in retrospect, I can explain why I wrote about it. I'd already been thinking about this, these features of um, how, you know, these aspects of work that's been assigned to women and so forth. But um in the moment, I just started writing um, without really. So that's my answer for what it's worth. Nice. It, it's a great answer. And, and many of us write to prompts. So this is another form of a prompt that, you know, you just give a, even if there's a little fragment, if you will, and those <laughs> textile fragments were a lot more than just small fragment. But you need that one little piece to hang on to and then see where it takes you. And I, I did want to add, because you reminded me about the prompts, is that I noticed that when I write about something that is a piece of visual um, art, that often somehow the poem formally reflects what I'm looking at. Um, and again, that's something that I might not realize until later, that this poem has this kind of repetitive stitching in it. And... Last year, I wrote a poem that I titled Cicade, and it it was based on a piece of art that had little 
repeat blocks of color, just basically blue and white repeated again and again and again. And the poem had that kind of flittering back and forth and was actually about the eye doing those little tiny eye movements. Um, and so I think I think that happens also subconsciously with a lot of ekphrastic, ekphrastic, yeah, that word, poems. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the people are becoming more comfortable with the word ekphrastic. I think the first year we didn't use that word at all um, because in, in most people say, what is that? And um, and now it, it's, it's, you know, if you subscribe to the rattle or the daily rattle, they have a regular ekphrastic challenge. So people are becoming very familiar with it. So how many of you without this kind of prompt regularly visit a gallery or museums or other art to um, inspire a poem for yourselves? Does anybody do that? You do, Sarah. I do, yeah. It's a now and again thing. It's maybe yeah. not like on purpose to go, but like sometimes I'll go and find myself have writing. How interesting. I find for, for myself, many poems come from my own images, you know, because I'm a photographer as well as a poet that I'm really thinking about an image that really melds with a thought and an idea. Um, I, I noticed something just about the creative process that when I came into the gallery and I was just standing and slowed down and standing in front of that painting, different than when I'm writing my own material, where I'm sort of looking inward for memory or, you know, you're going into an inner space. This was very different in terms of the creative process that I really like. I just stood there and let it come to me and me to it so it was it was I was just being receptive but there was an out there was an out you know a gesture out to meet it to meet the visual which is different than in writing from memory for me mm. that's interesting um, I'm just scanning some of the questions in the chat, and there's one I, I don't know that we really answered, but do, about whether you found that painting that you wrote about right away, or did you have to view all of them for a while and then select, or have it select you? Cynthia, uh, you I, wrote to yeah. several paintings. Tell me yeah. what your process was like. Actually, the um, the old friends, which is a collage, um, attracted me as an object, but it was not the first object in the gallery that I responded to. Um, I did write a poem. Um, in response to red chairs, for example. And I think to some extent that painting, if you're in the gallery, it's an enormous painting and you can't help but notice it, um, especially the way it's displayed on the far wall. You can even see it. I used to peek into the gallery when the gallery was closed and you know, you could always see that painting. But for some reason, the, the tools, why, it just reminded me, as I said, of a long ago visit with my grandmother. She's long since gone. Uh, she was from Lincolnville and uh, she worked at the sardine factory. And so I thought about that process and about the women. Um, I had written some notes way back when about it. And then also the general store um, where they did have tools hanging. And so I had that sort of connection I sort of remembered that and then the fire uh which really was uh, a terrible thing um got reminded me of that and that's where the connection happened it was kind of a long process 
because I thought about the other poems uh, or the other paintings first before that one. So, um, uh, you know, I, that, that I had to go back to the collage several times just to look at it more closely for what it suggested. Let's just say that. Nice. Nice. And anybody else want to comment to that question about whether it was one that hit you right away or did you have to view the whole exhibition several times before you figured out? Um, for me, I think part of it is a, the mystery of the response in me. Uh, and and I don't know what detail is going to hit me. I think that's partly what Lucinda was talking about. And then, and then what Charlie was talking about, unable to stop thinking about and, and his partner and that whole situation. And when I started hearing his poem and looking at the chairs, for me, then what happened is I saw the absences in the chairs so that your poem allowed me to see the painting in a completely different way from where I had initially seen it as a still life. And then um, Cynthia's uh, details. Um, so going back to these paintings uh, enlarges them for me. So, so I, had to, I had to look, I had to look very closely at the painting, but I allowed whatever details came forward to come forward. You know, I thought, should I describe that? But it's not a should, it's a what's happening, what's happening in a communication for me. I, I like the way you describe it as a communication. You know, there, there's a conversation that's happening in all of these poems between the poem, the poet or the narrator of the poem and the painting. Mm -hmm. and perhaps the artist behind the painting. It's what's so rich for me about this ekphrastic process of, of writing from, from artwork. Judy, I was struck when you have your camera off, so I'm not sure if you're right there or not, but um, maybe I'll wait till you, you're back on to ask you what I wanted to ask you. Um, somebody's asking about, are the poems and paintings available in some form to read them and look at the artwork again? And we typically do not publish the poems on the Poets' Corner any longer, because there's all kinds of complications. It's considered a publication. People might want to be submitting their poem elsewhere for publication. So we don't, but we do record this um, and that will be on the website. So anybody can come back and revisit a portion of the poem and the recording. And um, any of you as artists, if you want to um, offer your, let me know about your email or your website or where your poem can be found or seen, I'm happy to pass that along when I send out a message to everybody about the recording being available. Just let me know if you if you want people to write to you and ask for a written copy of your poem or not. So that would be one way to handle that. Um, we're kind of wrapping up at this point. If uh, Are there any other comments that um, any of our poets wanted to make? I really appreciate all of you. This has been a rich conversation and a wonderful, wonderful experience reading your poems and then hearing you read them. And uh, many, many thanks again to the Page Gallery for and Colin and Kirsten uh, for putting together this exhibition and bringing the artists together. A reminder, if you are in the area of Mid Coast, Maine, to please come to the reading next Saturday 
at one o'clock in the gallery. And if you happen to be in the area over the weekend, I'm doing a reading from my new collection of poetry uh, called Magma Intrusions at the Camden Library on Sunday at two o'clock. So you're also welcome to come to that. Would love to see you. Um, and those of you who are joining us remotely, thank you very much for being here and for supporting and coming to the Poets Corner every month. So thank you all and have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really beautiful. Beautiful poets, poetry from everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Meg. This was really wonderful. Thank you all. Yes, thank you everyone for being it's here. Special to be together. And now it's dark out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that happens way too early in Maine, doesn't it? <laughs>